My name is Monk Grow, and we're at Hamilton College filming for the Jazz Archive, and I'm very pleased to have Tom Lellis with me today. And I was trying to figure out how to introduce you as to what you do. You do a lot of things. But I saw on your website you said singer, composer, and instrumentalist. So that pretty much... Yeah, that's some, that pretty much sums it up. Most of it. Yeah. Do you think you're, uh, of yourself first as one of those? I, I think first of myself as a singer. Okay. Yeah, uh, because that's where I began, and really I didn't um, become an instrumentalist until I was uh, in my 20s. Did you do that out of necessity? Uh, both necessity and desire. Um, necessity because I was on the road playing with some musicians that were truly terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and. It, sometimes I would just tell them, give me my first note or an introductory chord and sort of say, I'll lay out. Maybe the bass player knew it, the tune. And so um, the other reason was that I wanted to play with the best of musicians and I had to learn their their language in order to keep up with them. And uh, and the dissatisfaction with, with the way that some people played right. as opposed to the way that I wanted to hear it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I heard my influences. Uh, the first one was McCoy Tyner and Chick Corea, and I had heard Bill Evans, and so those were those were specifically the influences that catapulted me to try to play piano. What is a bad accompanist? Well, either stylistically, uh, if you're trying to do something that isn't in the style of the accompanist, then they can take whatever you do and turn it into their style instead of what you hope the style would be and in essence I was uh, very attracted to um, post bop and modal and then you'd run into a purely bebop piano player who would not even approach that idiom or a, or a, a player who wouldn't approach ballads like maybe Bill Evans or a beautiful player they'd play bebop against the ballad and I'd want to be getting romantic and <laughs> hear bebop or you yeah. know and everything as soon as you get done singing it doubles up and everybody starts swinging and you know there goes the romance uh -huh. so I was hoping to keep things in in yeah. its genre a little longer right. and some of those players never did want to do that I think being being a singer can be a difficult proposition if you don't have if you're not playing because just if you describe like all of a sudden the trio pretty much just takes it out of your hands yes. and what are you going to do Right. On stage. Right. Say, no, I don't want double time here. Exactly. It's too late. That's right. So that's exactly why I started playing. And then I would, uh, later I began playing a secondary keyboard when I could afford another piano, mm -hmm. piano player. I was my own mediocrity for a few years, you know, mm -hmm. playing very ba badly. But um, I was able to maybe not play so much, but my hands are big and I can play maybe one beautiful big change in a chord in, in, in a bar instead of you know, two or three mm -hmm. chords in the bar. Yeah. And so I tried to um, follow Ellington's, you know, edit yourself and, uh, and the old uh, less is more and just uh, encapsulate what I wanted to say in one change instead of trying to develop a facility starting it in my 20s. It probably wasn't going to happen anyway. Yeah. Well, I think the thing you said about being able to speak the language is really important. It is. Uh, I've worked with a lot of singers who, who can't do that, and it, it, it really makes it harder. It does. It, it you know, limits everyone on the bandstand. Mm -hmm. So if the singer it has, uh, knows the realm of the musician, then there can be a dialogue and th the sky's the limit. But with limitations, you know, I tell the singers all the time that they have to know what they're singing and they have to be the time. That's mm -hmm. a that's a big thing with me. I, I think that singers rely on the, the, the band for the time, and they float, and they go behind, or way behind. Mm -hmm. I think that the singer has a, a, an obligation to be the time, to evoke the time, either whether it's a ballad or an up-tempo thing, whatever it is, to say that they can handle the time, they know where it is, and they can create the synergy that, that everyone playing the time can create. In your opinion, who was a good example of that? Wow, 
There's, there was a lot, but I mean, my first influences were, were Mel Torme, Sinatra, Ella, Sarah Vaughan, Carmen McRae, uh, Billy Eckstein, mm -hmm. um, even Vic Damone, Jack Jones, uh, Joe Williams. Uh, so those people, whether specific tunes or in general, they either swung or were romantic and were able to carry these emotions. Whatever they were singing, they were able to convey that emotion. And I think a lot of it is, is in the time, as much as the, the phrasing and, and uh, the notation, you know? Okay. Was there, do you have a musical household when you grew up? No, but my mother, uh, getting up for breakfast in the morning, she, there was a great disc jockey in Cleveland, Ohio, where I was born. His name was Bill Randall, and he played all those great singers. And my mother, we came from a kind of blue collar, no, no frills background, but when the radio was on and uh, a great singer was playing, she would just light up and start oh. dancing around the kitchen and sing harmony with Mel Torme and Ella Fitzgerald. And, and she would break into harmony just, and I would go, how do you do that? Like oh. cock my head like some dog going, what? <laughs> and so I'm sure that she was definitely my musical influence. Mm -hmm. And it made her happy. And in the middle of sort of, you know, that blue collar kind of grimness, I wanted to make her happy too. So I oh. think I started singing uh -huh. at five years old. Did you go through the high school chorus and all that? Or I sang yeah. in the choir, um, but I started singing professionally at 15 mm. in a rock and roll band and did like the talent shows and I was in choirs and things like that. Okay, when you were 15, what was rock and roll? Uh, rock and roll was like Chuck Berry mm -hmm. and... Um, and then the Motown thing came in, and um, and then the, I left rock and roll when the British invasion was coming in because and uh, the Four Seasons and all that because everyone started singing like uh, a castrati. <laughs> <laughs> everyone sang so high, and I and my I was getting bigger and more baritone as <laughs> with every passing day, and I just realized that rock and roll had had gone into some stratosphere that I'd have to sing falsetto, you know. Well, so that's that's when I sort of made the switch. I see. Well, you, uh, walking over here, you were talking about working at a young age in Syracuse, actually. Yes. And I'm curious when you were doing that work, and then you said you had a child at that time. Yeah. Was there some feeling like this is a hard thing I've chosen to do and now I have a family and I'm trying to be a professional singer was it a hard role well not quite then because I hadn't been uh, you know the, the baby was just coming like in the I was at this club for the fifth largest club in the country uh, the Three Rivers Inn in Syracuse so I was elated to be there and playing at 20 21 years old playing with a 15 piece house band every mm -hmm. night with some great players from upstate here so I was actually in heaven and just wide-eyed and coming out of rock and roll and I had done some a little bit of uh, more nightclub kind of things before I got to Syracuse but that was this was my graduate course in music mm -hmm. it really was to see Ray Charles for nine days and and to see these great acts come in and just wide-eyed <clears throat> what did you learn from watching those people well that's when I learned I'd probably have to play piano because I saw Ray Charles come in and, and Buddy Greco came in and he said that he was making $1,500 a week back in the 40s with a hit record and he gave it up to play piano with Benny Goodman for $150 a week. And, and he, he told me he would take me out playing golf when people would invite him to the country club so I'd go out and play golf with him. Mm. And he said, what are you doing here? What are you, why, don't you, why aren't you back just you know, singing somewhere. He didn't want me being a house singer, an MC, just having a little spot on the show. He said, go work, go out on the road, you know, or go home and work a lot. And I think those examples, Ray Charles and Buddy Greco, kind of pointed me the way to piano because I saw mm -hmm. that they were great musicians. They could sit down and play, well, obviously Ray, but, but Buddy Greco, too, was a fine pl uh, piano player. Mm -hmm. So with that example, I think they kind of got my head on a little straight that I was going to have to become a musician. What about interacting with the audience? Did that come naturally for you, sort of, that's a big part of being a singer and being able to be sort of a front man? Yeah, uh, well I did it in rock and roll for from 15 to, to about 20 
And then when I got in the nightclub, there, well, I do remember the first time I was on this big stage and 1,200 people out there in a theater restaurant, and I started singing. My leg was going like that, <laughs> yeah. and, and my entire voice was quivering. So it, it took a little transition, you know, uh -huh. and a little getting used to. But I think um, I was always fairly confident about, about the way I sang. So if I knew the material, and you get past the initial n nervousness, and then it was okay. Mm -hmm. And you would be singing cover material, right? Absolutely. Sinatra. Standards, yeah, yeah, and cover material. And, yeah. and um, as I was saying, Cal Custer, great, he was the assistant conductor of the Syracuse Symphony, arranged some things for me. So I had some, some specific material that I would do, and it was great. I thought about that arranging uh, issue when I was listening to your recording with uh, the Metropole Orchestra and how fantastic those arrangements are. But I wonder if you've ever had a circumstance where you had arrangements written for you that didn't work, and what do you do? Yeah. You know, I can't say that I have because, uh, actually, I haven't had that many arrangements. Cal wrote some uh, uh, then when I was very young, and these arrangements. But I was never in a position to play with that large an ensemble, mm -hmm. usually. That big band in Syracuse and the orchestra were the exceptions. Okay. So I would mostly small groups. I'd have to put down amongst your things that you seem to be an arranger to me also, though. I, I do think in those terms. Yeah, because some of the the tunes, you're a, you're a song put together person. Yes. You know, so uh, on some of your CDs, there's the, uh, what's the one you do? Bobbles, Bangles, and I Get a Kick Out of You. Yes. Here, and, and, uh, ain't and no I'm, mountain high ain't enough. Ain't no mountain high enough and still haven't found what I'm looking for right. from, from you two. Yeah, you know, I talked to Kenny Werner, a great piano player, and, and he would always uh, quote other tunes in the middle of his solos. You know, a lot of players yeah. do that. And, and I think that came with experience. You just hear progressions and, uh, uh, and chords and how things are, are similar. And, and then all of a sudden, you just kind of uh, assimilate this ability to hear these things and mm -hmm. oh that sounds like and then and, but that was that was a late development uh -huh. yeah very do you have uh songwriting tools that you use at home to, to write like tape i mean do you do things on tape and then listen back or you do computer uh well i have the computer but i usually do that after post the yeah. writing no i just kind of sit there and play piano until i get some a, a, a series, a progression, or, or a, a series of changes that intrigues me. Mm -hmm. uh, usually the changes come first, and then I'll write the melody and the lyrics. Okay. That was the uh, proverbial question, which yeah. comes first. <laughs> yeah, usually the, the, the changes, the chords. Uh huh. And I'll set that up, and, and if that's intriguing to me, then I'll, I'll work on a, a, mo a melody that is hopefully as intriguing, mm -hmm. and then I'll try to write some lyrics that don't embarrass me. <laughs> because that's, that's a big deal with me, too. Do, do your songs seem to naturally fall into some kind of standard form? Like when you're writing, say, okay, it's time, time I need a bridge here. Or are they just more... Uh, organic. Than, huh? Organic or... You know, that's a good question. I can't, I, I can't honestly give you an answer because I think... Um, if there's a criticism of me, it may be that I'm a little too eclectic, hmm. or as George Bush says, eclectic. Eclectic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, that's a whole other yeah, yeah, subject. Yeah, yeah, we'll get there. Uh, but uh, <laughs> so this eclecticism, I search for the the um, not standard. You know, I try to write things that maybe aren't in the, the proverbial forms or A A B A, or you know, I, I search for those things that are slightly different that maybe I can put my imprint on that may be a little more in individual. And sometimes that works, uh, and and sometimes I fall back into you know the the A A B kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But usually I'm looking for something that intrigues you know my sensibilities, and then I I feel that it. All music has to come through me to get to you. If it doesn't intrigue me, it's going to come out at about three inches and fall to the floor. Uh -huh. If I feel it, then there's a good chance of me conveying that to you. So that's how I feel about composition, too, and okay. melody and lyrics. Have you ever written either a song or an arrangement? I'm trying to think how to phrase this. 
in response to something that's popular at the time and and you think like that's the direction I need to go here I don't know about popular but again intriguing it might be you know I, I remember writing a couple of tunes that had sort of a birdland kind of uh, okay. rhythm because I was intrigued by that rhythm but not to you know I have a theory about populism and that is that if you chase that populism train you'll never catch it and by the, and if you did the trend will have been over mm. so I, I I figured I don't know exactly when it was maybe in my late 20s I said that uh, I was gonna set out on my own path and hope to intersect a trend uh -huh. because I was never going to catch one and, right. and you know I felt that way about it that's the nature of trends the, you have to you have to start them I think it's yeah the, well, it's or the as they say intersect and maybe you yeah. never will I mean uh -huh. that, that possibility exists and I I, I dealt with that too you know mm -hmm. I, so now at this point a little more philosophically I'm just looking to create a body of work and hopefully it will stand the test of time and I may not be around for that time you know but when you look back, the great composers and the people that have influenced all of us, you know, I don't think they were writing for their specific time. They were writing what they felt and, and what, was, uh, what it meant to them. And it lived because it was timeless. Mm -hmm. So that's what I aspire to, whether you achieve that is, uh, you yeah. know, time will tell. Was your mother happy that you became a professional musician? I, I think so. I think that she was worried, you know, and mm -hmm. my father always said, well, why don't you like be a barber or something, have a, a, a trade? And he was probably right because with the oscilloscope pattern of the ups and downs yeah. of, of music, I probably should have had a, a, a trade or something. But um, I, I've been very fortunate that uh, there's the, that philosophy of cornucopia. You get not everything you want but you get just enough to proceed <laughs> and and I've been very fortunate in that regard well, that's a good observation um, I'm curious if you how much of your musical knowledge and so forth came from the educational system well none as a singer I never mm -hmm. studied um, I had a quasi-manager when I was singing rock and roll who brought some uh, teachers in from the Cleveland Institute. And they said, don't, don't mess with him. Just maybe he needs some breathing or something. But stylistically, leave him alone because the teacher will teach him to, teach, to sing the way they do. But then when I went to piano, I studied with Bill Dobbins, who I was mm -hmm. working with. Uh, oh. he, he was had the Kent State Lab Band in, in uh, at Kent State, but I was fortunate to work with him, and I studied with him and Bill Gidney, a great jazz pianist who was in Cleveland, and Phil Rizzo, who used to be, uh, arrange for the Stan Kenton Band. I studied theory from Phil, and then went to Bill Dobbins, and uh, Bill gave me transcriptions of all the pianists, you know, Chick Corea and and Monk, and mm -hmm. you know, so I was able to use those transcriptions to. To, to see their styles and assimilate some of that. So I did study uh, theory and, and some piano. Okay. What do you have a feeling about jazz education these days? Well, having taught in, uh, in the schools, uh, some schools in the U.S., and I, I taught for a semester as a guest professor in Graz, Austria. Um, at KUG there, which was, it's a very prestigious, uh, one of the only jazz schools uh, in, maybe the only one in Austria. And I prefer the European because it seems to me that the educational system in the U.S. stops at, uh, like Ken Burns' jazz uh, mm -hmm. uh, documentary, it stops at 1955 or wherever. They don't even go into the, the 60s and beyond. So Maybe that's changed now, or maybe in maybe other programs. But the programs that I taught in, I was I thought they were a little bit anachronistic, frankly. Are you talking about like jazz schools? Yes. Gee, that's interesting you say that because some people feel that the jazz, a lot of the current jazz teachers or players start at Coltrane. Well, I don't see them teaching that, though. I th uh -huh. see them teaching bebop much more. Oh, right. Yes. Much more than yes. the, than Coltrane or mm -hmm. 
you know, Joe Henderson or, you know, that kind of, yeah. yeah. I see it, you know, pre that. And how would you teach Coltrane? Well, that's a good question. I wouldn't, <laughs> frankly, because uh, I don't think I'm qualified. Yeah. But, um, no, as a singer, I, I, I try to give them a, a, a spectrum that takes them into the modern uh, post-bop modal kind of thing because that's what intrigued me. You know, I don't think I would have been a jazz musician had I been... Uh, limited to bebop. Bebop, I don't think it's a great singer's music. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, and in fact, I feel that when I wrote a whole article on my website about jazz dividing and conquering itself. Yeah. I, okay. Yes. <laughs> and, and that. I want to talk about that. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a big thing to me because I think the bebop era took the singers out of the music. Uh, er, all the, the great singers, Ellen, Sarah, and, you know, and Billy Eckstein, all those great singers were in the swing era. And then when bebop came in, it got very analytical, very, you know, it's a brilliant music and difficult. But as an idiom for singers, I don't think it was wonderful because there were these perfunctory little heads that went on to long solos. Right. And those perfunctory little heads were nothing for the singer to sing. And I think it gave rise to a lot of singers who weren't the best of the crop that sang those perfunctory little heads and then and then did all the, the uh, vocalese or scatting as the bebop players did, where I was looking for the content in the lyric and the emotion of these songs that, that was generated in the swing era. Mm -hmm. So then I totally, as my, my taste, I should say, totally skipped the bebop era. I think I came in with milestones. I heard milestones and went, wow. It had a great record. Right. And then, because it, it skipped those bar lines, started floating over the bar lines. You know, that, mm -hmm. uh, we da, da. that just, I just went, wow, what is that? And then I heard McCoy and doing his, the modal thing, and that was another thing that just slayed me. I just said, wow, this is, that's what made me play piano. Two specific Compositions: McCoy Tyner's Man from Tanganyika, which I performed last night, and Chick Corea's Tones for Jones Bones. Mm. I heard them and I just was floored. I said, well, so I wanted to play with them. Unfortunately, they were booked. So I had to, that's when I started playing piano. I see. Did you hear them live? Too? I have both of them, yeah. yeah. There was a great club in Cleveland that we would open for many acts, and I got to open for Bill Evans, where I met Eddie Gomez and subsequently recorded with him later, and uh, Jimmy Smith, and um, so they all came through in six nights, and we got to hear them. So everybody came through, Miles and McCoy and Keith Jarrett, and w the first inversion, uh, version of Weather Report. Wow. Yeah, so the, this was a very enlightening time for me. Mm -hmm. What's the first... <laughs> Tune, instrumental tune that you were inspired to. Really? Yes, I was about seven, eight. I started singing that solo. That is a Bordeaux great Bordeaux. solo. <laughs> it, that is the. I, it's so funny you say that because that's like the perfect solo. It, it was. I was. I just loved it. Just, just couldn't get enough of it. That was Bobby Hackett, wasn't I it? I thought it was Gordell Gray. Maybe it was Bobby. I think it's Bobby. Hatton. Yeah, I mean, you're probably you probably know better than that. <laughs> but it was String of Pearls, yeah. and it was just I loved it as a kid. That was definitely it. Uh huh. There's a funny anecdote that Joe Wilder told me about that, and they were playing in the mood at some TV thing or something, and the trumpet player said, "Watch this." And he played that solo uh -huh. over in the mood, yeah. right? Uh, I believe. <laughs> and the conductor's going, what? What? <laughs> what? <laughs> Man after my own heart. I love that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, that was it. I, I just was so uh, is rapturous. It was uh -huh. beautiful. And what lyric did you did it did it did you write a lyric to that? No. Okay. No. In fact, I have never written a lyric to a solo. Okay. I, I right, write, that's more like that's the vocal east thing, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. No, I just write them to the to the heads of tunes. Uh -huh. What uh, I'm sometimes curious as to what makes you pick 
a particular song. Too. Yeah, just those things that intrigue me. Yeah. That, yeah, that, uh, that either they sink into my head and I can't get them out of my head, mm -hmm. or they're so just intriguing, uh, either the changes or, or the intervals or whatever in the melody, like uh, McCoy's Man from Tanganyika was in 12-8 and it had these bars of 9-8, and I didn't know that until later. But it was just so staccato and so so flowing over the 12-8, and the 12-8 was so exotic. I was uh, impressed by the words that you managed to articulate Thank to that you. last night. Thanks. And uh, I'm wondering if the story, you hear that melody, do you come up sort of with a, a theme or a storyline and then try to fashion the words to get the story to go with the melody? I literally went to the library and looked up Tanganyika and started studying about Tanganyika okay. to find some material. And then I wanted to uh, evoke um, the dignified primitive nature of things, how these people were, may be primitive, but they, they existed long before governments. And, mm -hmm. and that intrigued me. And McCoy said he wrote it about a man he met from Tanganyika, mm -hmm. right? So that was all that I knew about it from the album uh, that it came on. So I, I just tried to, and I really wanted to pay homage to the influence of African, the African influence that, that it had on me because I was very intrigued by it. Mm. And this is, a, this is an African-based music, you know, and it comes from there and I'm, you know, I, I wanted to pay some respect to that and be respectful of it. And so I included as much respect as I could in the tribal sense and then tried to convey that, you know, generations pass and as the generations passed it turned from Tanganyika into Tanzania. And and that that occurred with these these people probably had yeah. no idea and they just proceeded in their own culture and mm -hmm. and kept it and it to me there's a, a, a definite dignity there that I I wanted to convey. And it's profound. There was a profoundness that I heard in Man from Tanganyika. It was like African classical music to me. Oh. What um, got you into Brazilian music? Uh, well, I was aware of, um, in, the, uh, in the 60s, I was aware of uh, um, Stan Getz and um, Sir Gilberto and uh, Joao Gilberto, that, that era of, of things. But uh, some musicians in Cleveland, uh, Skip Haddon, who now teaches at Berkeley, drums at Berkeley, he was very broad and he would bring records by Hermeto Pascual and uh, and um, when I heard Milton Nascimento and people like that in the early 70s um, and then uh, the second tune I ever wrote lyrics to was Keith Jarrett's Lucky Southern with Ayrton Ayrton Maria it was on an Ayrton album and um, it was a samba and <laughs> there's another rhythm the exotic rhythms. I love Brazilian music because, like jazz, it has influences from Africa. They had slavery there and, and imported a lot of Africans. So there was the same elements that created jazz in our country, in America, were present in Brazil with different, slightly different influences. The Indian influence there was different. So they brought the jungle sounds in, but the African influence was very heavy and the European Portuguese influence. So they, we had European influences and the African mixed to make jazz. And down there, those influences mixed to make Brazilian music. So to me, it's, there's a logic there that mm -hmm. those same elements came together to intrigue me again. Wow. And I'm Italian, yeah. so my Latin thing comes out there. I don't like necessarily Italian music, but it certainly comes out in the Brazilian. How so? Well, you know, I mean, the Italian thing is very, you know, operatic or very hyper-romantic. Uh -huh. But the Brazilian thing, I think um, in jazz, there's this hard edge thing where, you know, I, I think that there was uh, elements where people thought I was gay because I wanted to be romantic in jazz. Whereas in Brazilian music, you can be macho and you can be romantic. Mm. In, in Mexican or Spanish music or Cuban music or Brazilian music, you can be very macho and still be very hyper-romantic. Whereas in jazz, there's always this hard edge, train kind of, you know, hard, big, brassy, you know, don't, mm -hmm. don't get... 
I like the romantic. I like to appeal to the other half of, you know, uh, the audience. Uh -huh. And so I, that comes out in Brazilian music without any trouble. I see. That's really it. Have you had a chance to go I have, there? yes. And I've, uh, uh, Tony Niorta, who's a, a collaborator of mine, is in New York now. We've just been talking. So I may go down there to record with him, but I have been to, uh, to Brazil and the people walk with rhythm. <laughs> they, they, it's, it's a beautiful thing. I had an experience once when I was in school, in a public school, and I played the beginning of a Paul Simon record. Yeah, with Milton or? Uh, uh, it was just those, those snare drums going, uh -huh. and there was a Brazilian exchange student in the class, and he perked up immediately and said, oh, this is real then. This That's is, right. You know, yeah. Very interesting. Huh? They're very. Signature sound. It's a very earth connected music to me because of all those influences. They have jungle sounds and the cuica and all these instruments that evoke the jungle. And then you have those beautiful harmonies from Europe. And then you have this, this more primitive, uh, primitive is hardly the word because it's mm. very sophisticated. Yeah. The rhythms are very sophisticated. Bayon and, and samba and, and the way they dance, I mean. <sighs> And yeah. seven, four sambas, and my God, those are very sophisticated. So all these elements, you, th you know, there is this element of primitiveness, but it's the, the, the culmination is very sophisticated mm -hmm. to me. Yeah, it's interesting what we call primitive. Isn't yeah, it? <laughs> it really is. Yeah, but I liked your explanation of, of thinking of seven, four, and two sections, and it becomes 14. Yeah, well, you know, a drummer explained that to me. I, I see. Went, oh, the uh, dawn, yeah. you know? It was like, phew. Yeah. Um, are you influenced at all by nature in your writing, yes. your inspirations? Yeah, um, because the more society gets away from nature and diminishes its, the integral part that it plays in our life, the more I want to go back to it, yes, mm -hmm. very much. I love to write about the wind and the water and, and uh, you know, the, the emerald forests and things. I do. I, I love to bring nature into it because that's the, the more realism. That's where the realism is. You know, mm -hmm. you can you can easily give emotion to those things. Were you influenced? Uh, you have two daughters. I have two daughters and a son. Have you been influenced at all over the years by the music they listened to as they grew up? Uh, oh yes, they've they've opened me up to some uh, some. I must say my, my uh, older daughter and my son, too, has influenced me. My younger daughter, uh, not so much. Mm -hmm. But now I've influenced her. She, she has a, a compilation of Brazilian music, and some of it is very, you know, very earthy Brazilian music that she now likes. But, uh, yeah, to some extent. You mentioned the, um, I think you called it, the oscilloscope of a career. Yes. Um, and sort of tying in with your thing you wrote about jazz recordings, and has there been a time, a series of years that were the best, and and a series of years that were really the hardest for you? Working absolutely, and that has been. You know, I have found, frankly, that the more individualistic I get, the less I work. Hmm. When you don't cover and follow those trends then you become an entity that has no bearing on anything that's currently happening. So it moves you, you know, to, out of the mainstream somewhat. Yet I view those, those times as maybe some of my most productive times mm -hmm. because I, I learned to play piano and about nine years ago started playing nylon string guitar for the Brazilian things from the influence of Tuninho Horta. Um, my favorite Brazilian composer and guitarist. And so those down periods uh, had their own benefits, uh, even though they were not necessarily great financial years. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm, you know, I can't say that I'm happy with the, um, the uh, amount that I have been able to actually sing. You know, mm -hmm. I, I would have liked to have been performing much more than my career has afforded uh -huh. me. What has to happen these days to get three nights in a row at the Blue Note, for instance? Well, 
You know, if I knew that, maybe I could get three nights of, yeah, yeah, I I frankly don't know. Uh Uh, My business uh, acumen is not, you know, anything to Mm -hmm. write home about. But again, I I think I've taken a longer philosophical view that I'm going to try to create a body of work. And uh, as I say, Cornucopia has allowed me to do that, maybe not on the highest level of economic, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, plateaus, but... Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I, I think that it's been the current musical scene is very detrimental to quality. There's, I hear singers that just are abysmal in many genres. And uh, I quote Ray Charles about rap. He says, it's just talking. It's just talking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and so I just quote Ray because it is. It's literally just talking. So that has been very detrimental. I think people, there are so many antichrists that I have, you know, uh, 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 singers that just, I don't think, belong in front of a microphone that are very popular now. They have, you know, they sound like frogs croaking a song out, and they, they have no pitch, and I mean, you know, it goes from, from Bruce Springsteen to Elvis Costello, and I think these people are frauds, just utter, total frauds. Do you think the uh, 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 the American Idol syndrome and stuff plays into that? Well, that's that's like you know. Well, let me. I'll, I'll tell you a bigger a, a bigger overview is that I think that business has conspired to bring the masses into music. They want the masses to to you know. They want you to be a singer. They want everyone to be able to sing. So now instead of, you know, to get to Carnegie Hall, you practice, practice, practice. Now you, you, like they promoted the pet rock, you just promote something till it's so popular you can buy Carnegie Hall. (laughs) Yeah. And that's how I feel about it. Mm -hmm. I feel that the quality that, that the great musicians that you've interviewed and that we all know have spent these years trying to hone a craft and all of a sudden, that quality doesn't matter. It's, it's not about that anymore. It's about something else. And that something else is a scandalous scheme, a businessman's dream. That's a, that's a lyric that's coming. Okay. <laughs> and that's what that's it is. One. I feel that all these Harvard graduates, business graduates, they're going, well, why do I want to deal with a temperamental artist? Let me create Millie Vanilli. Mm-hmm. And so I, I blame, you know, in a culture, the most, the big, the tallest things in that culture are the most important things. And it used to be churches, and now it's City Court Center. Now it's what? City Court. Oh, okay. You know, or, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. Corporate buildings. Yeah. So they have that bottom line. And that bottom line and art, they don't mix. They shouldn't mix. Mm. Some of the fellows uh, that I talked to had pointed out that. Years ago, the heads of the record companies were musicians. Yes. And that they felt it made a big difference. Well, it does. That's yeah. what I'm saying. These business, Harvard business graduates, they, they learn to sell anything. So why do they want to deal with, you know, temperamental quality? Yeah. Or maybe not even temperamental. They just, they don't know. They don't know. They were trained in business. They weren't trained in music. Mm. So maybe they like, maybe they, you know, maybe they think, the the sun sets on you know with Bruce Springsteen. What's your? Uh, I played a gig a, f- a couple months ago, and some woman said to me, "We want to hear those, you know those uh, those older songs, th- those Rod Stewart songs." <laughs> right. There's another one. I didn't mention him. Should have. <laughs> I said the Rod Stewart songs. Then I finally figured out what she was talking about, you know. The, oh, the, cl- the, uh, the standards. standards album that he recorded. Yeah, Rod right. doing the standards. Right. You know, I say, well, let me see. Let me, <laughs> let me drink booze for about 20 years and have a little sip of hydrochloric acid, and then I'll go into the studio. That's what, that's what it would take for me to get to that place. Hmm. And I just, I reject it totally. I see. Well, if, if you could get in a time machine, is there a couple moments... In well, not necessarily just jazz history, but maybe where could you would you like to go back to and be a fly on the wall? 
Hmm. Yeah, you know, I don't think, I guess I don't think in terms like that. Okay. I think that uh, hopefully one views their career as an ascent, you know? Yeah. So for me going back, you mean in uh, historically? Yeah, you know? I just mean like, is there like a record date or something you'd like to have watched or something like that? Well, maybe, uh, maybe Sinatra and Nelson Riddle. Mm-hmm. Or uh, or something like something like that era where uh, there was a great arranger and a full orchestra and I could I could just you know not worry about anything but singing the song you know mm. maybe that era yeah right that must have been a heck of a feeling when you did that with with the Metropole <sighs> Orchestra did you do that live I, we did it live wow yeah and uh, John Clayton conducted so it was oh it was the thrill of my life it came out of the blue. Uh, Mark Murphy had uh, told me to send my material to the Netherlands, and then I did. I sent the material, and I got an email maybe uh, maybe eight months, nine months later, maybe a year. And the uh, producer said that uh, he he just kept listening to my record. He just kept playing it, and he goes back to it, and he said, "I can't promise you anything, but I'm I'm keeping you in mind." And then. I did a performance at the IAJE uh, in New York in 1998 with Joe Locke and mm-hmm. Tony Marino, who was just on the gig last night, and Jamie Haddad. And um, he was there, and we signed a contract to do it the next oh. day. For a year and a month later, I had to wait 13 months to do it, and it was, <laughs> it was the longest period. Now, that was such a thrill. I, I had to keep my welled up tears down in mm-hmm. the middle of a couple of those takes mm-hmm. just because I was just I did off the <laughs> out of the studio I did shed a few tears yeah. just of happiness wow. it was my wife was there it was a totally el- uh. elating time it was a thrill how much um, input did you have with with your arrangers I spoke to Micah Benny and uh, uh, Vince Mendoza and Chuck Owen, but I didn't speak to uh, the Dutch arranger that arranged two tunes uh, on that. And I was sorry, and, he, and I think the producer was kind of sorry. I think he didn't want me to actually communicate with them too much. He wanted, you know, some some individuality there, and then we'd all come together. But I spoke, uh, I spoke and and talked at length with the three of the arrangers out of mm-hmm. four. You gave them your keys, and here's, yeah, here's uh, my idea of... Well, conceptually, yeah. yeah. And then um, I know Micah Benny wrote in some some extensions in the, in the tunes yeah. that, you know, and you get to the rehearsal and you find out then, the first day, what these charts sound like. You never hear them. Oh, so Lord. I got there on a Monday. We, I heard the charts, them rehearsing the charts Monday. We started rehearsing on Tuesday. And we were uh, supposed to finish rehearsing on Wednesday and then record Thursday and Friday. Uh, no, I'm sorry. We were supposed to rehearse one day and then begin recording on, on the second day. And we didn't get through the rehearsals. The charts were tough and very involved. Wow. So we started recording uh, late on Wednesday. And we had Wednesday and Thursday. And then we did fixes, the orchestra fixes. And I had a couple on Friday. And we were out of there. Yeah. What a thrill, though. It was just, it was a great thrill. Uh, Something I never, you know, it was a dream Mm -hmm. come true because there's that Nelson Riddle Orchestra thing. And, you know, it was a total dream before that. And it was, I'll never forget that. Wow. Kind of interesting that it happened across the pond, as they say. Yeah, it really was. Ironic. Yeah. (laughs) Do you get to travel around much... uh, I, I have, yeah, I have, I've traveled in Europe. I haven't really been to Asia yet, mm-hmm. but uh, South America and Europe and... Uh, and I see some photos of you in Australia. Yeah, I was yeah. in last... That's true. I forgot about Australia and New Zealand uh, last mm-hmm. last fall. That was a great experience, too. Reception different? or You know, the road is wonderful. Uh, Everywhere I go on the road... I wish New York was like that, uh-huh. you know? Uh, no, I, I was totally in love with European audiences, and, and Australia and New Zealand were wonderful. South America was wonderful, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, I promised I would um, play a couple things for you. Let me see if I can make this happen here. Don't shine Like the 
used to shine. Gotta be Nancy, right? Yeah. I'm just curious if, if you recall this particular record. Um, as a singer, it's not the ones I was looking for. Here's one I'm looking for. Happy talk. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Sure. She's she's killing Nancy. And uh, Never Will I Marry. Oh, oh. my, my. <laughs> no, Nancy's beautiful. You know, I studied all those. And I didn't mention Nancy, and I should have. I studied as many of the good singers as, as I could. I mean, laying in, down on the floor in front of the speakers, just studying them. And I went through all of them, and the last one was Carmen McRae, who I'm born on Carmen's birthday, and I didn't even know that. And... And I just loved the way she could go from, from uh, soft and tender to hard and edgy and, and nasty almost. And she's a great interpreter. And then I stopped at about 24 when I started playing piano. I stopped listening to singers for influence. I went to the instrumentalists. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, uh, with all the influence that I got from these wonderful singers, then I went to the instrumentalists who were playing all these different linear approaches. And that's how I hoped uh, I would develop into something slightly different than my predecessors. And uh, I don't know if I have or not, but I know that the study of music has helped me to, to go to places that some, I feel a lot of singers haven't gone, mm -hmm. uh, at least on that path. But she's, she's so yeah. good. I love the record, too. She's got these cool arrangements with Cannonball oh, and that. Yeah, well, that, I saw them live in Cleveland when, mm -hmm. you know, I was 18 years old yeah. and there was a great club called Leo's Casino uh -huh. and you had to put laser on your neck because you couldn't drink at 18. And oh, we had these uh, Hawaiian laser on our neck and, me and um, my future wife and I were sitting there and we saw Cannonball and Nancy and loved every minute of it. Oh, Swung. you saw the two of them together? Yes. Oh, I'm jealous. Oh, it was sizzling. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. He's my favorite. Uh, me too. Yeah. I quote him in a lyric, Cannonball. Do you? I do, in Keeper of the Flame. What was it that grabbed you about him? Well, you know, everybody loves Charlie Parker, mm -hmm. you know, and I love Charlie too, but I think Cannonball did more with less. He I swung so. harder with less. Yeah. You feel that way? I think it's plus his tone was, oh. I mean, if, as a saxophone player, it's like, well, there you go. There you go. And he used the Latin thing, and he, he expanded apps. He was a big influence as far as my Latin thing, you know. Um, uh, there was a great tune by Victor Feldman, um, Azul Serape. Hmm. Oh, what a great tune. Knocked me down. Loved it. Wow. Yep. Well, here's a... Uh, I don't think I've ever asked this question of anybody, but I'll try it out on you. Do you do you believe in any kind of reincarnation? Yes, I, I do. I I, um, I think that um, there is a spirit that goes. I don't know if we come back as the same type of being, mm -hmm. or even on this planet. You know, but I do think that that when we leave something, some echo of us, maybe it goes to another dimension, literally. But you know, I have no idea where it goes, and I'm not, I have no philosophy about that. <laughs> but I don't think it ends. I don't think it ends. Okay. Because I'm often curious about, well, in your case, why does a, someone born in Cleveland, right, become attracted to uh, African influence or Brazilian music or where do these things come from? Why, why are you opened up to those kinds of opportunities? You know, I, I can trace that back to one phrase when I was studying for my first Holy Communion and some witch-like nun said, you know, if you're not Catholic, you're going to hell. And I thought, oh my God, all the... All the uh, the people preceding Jesus Christ, all the, you know, they're all in hell? And I rejected it right there. And so any, any 
I reject tribalism of any kind. And I think that countries and religions and races and nationalities, those are all tribes. And if we can leave the tribal, then we can ascend as a whole. So that's why I, I don't feel that I don't feel superior or inferior to, to anyone, but I certainly don't feel superior to anyone. Mm -hmm. and, and if you feel that way, then everyone has validity, you know? Everyone, somebody cleaning the street or the president, well, <laughs> I don't want to go there. <laughs> well, I wanted to go there. Uh, yeah, <laughs> go, right ahead, go right ahead. <laughs> You're Bush League. Yes. Talk about your Bush League. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm making an edu educated guess that you're not too happy with the current state of affairs. Yeah, I think in it's this the greatest travesty, travesty this country has, has endured. Hmm. I thought Nixon was bad. I thought Reagan split up the, the, uh, the community. In fact, I think Reagan began the entire whole rap movement and all that when, they, when, when he said, he, I don't think he was necessarily racist. I just think that he said, if you don't have money, I'm sorry, I can't deal with you. And so that took a lot of, of, of people and just put them out of society's flow. And then this guy came along and he's rewritten all the rules or, or broken all the rules. I think he is a travesty. I think he is the most detrimental thing this country has endured. Hmm. Period. I think the election in 2000, I was... I was on the streets the day after the election. I had a sign that said, Supreme C-O-U-R-T, and the bottom said, C-O-U coup d'etat. Because mm. that's what I think we've endured. I think the Supreme Court vote that took one vote changed the national election. You know, I just heard, read in the Times that it's within the Constitution, with a majority of Congress, they can change the number of, of uh, Supreme Court justices, and it's been down to five and as high as 11. Really? Yes. I didn't know that. I didn't know that either. <laughs> I read it in the Times about three days ago, uh -huh. and I was amazed. So that decision and placing this figurehead in, in office against the, the popular vote, it, I just think it's a travesty. I, I do everything I can. I write letters. I write, you know, funny things. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dick, try Dick Cheney sings Cheney of Fools. Yeah, like right. That. My favorite is uh, Condoleezza Rice sings, Oh, What a Beautiful Warning. Oh, What a Beautiful Warning. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's my you, favorite. Yeah, you almost have to make some fun. Well, you do. You literally have to yeah. make light of it because that's how devastating it is, I feel. Do you think um, we, can, we can repair it? Uh, how, in, how, 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 how can we? I think for the, the benefit of the country, this man, above all, needs to be impeached. I wrote an article uh, it, that was actually printed in, or a, a letter that was printed in uh, the Long Island uh, news, New York Newsday, and it was about uh, crying wolf. The, the impeachment of, of Clinton was, was a terrible thing. It shouldn't have happened. For, uh, for the, uh, an affair between two people, no one mm -hmm. other than them. And, but the result of that was that everyone is now afraid to impeach the actual wolf because this guy is the wolf and mm -hmm. he's in the White House. And now everyone's afraid to go through that process. But constitutionally, he's been abysmal. There are now right-wing Heritage Foundation people and left-wingers that are now getting together and saying that he needs to be impeached. And there was just a brilliant Bill Moyers uh, a journal uh, two weeks ago that these two opposites were on the air with Bill Moyers saying that for the benefit of this country, we need to impeach this man. Because this it's not going to it's not going to go away. And to leave this precedence is the most detrimental thing to our, to our country that I have witnessed in my lifetime. Including uh, the late 60s when everything was so in such turmoil. Well, at least the late 60s, the population rose. Yeah. They rose up and said, enough of this. Enough, 65,000 deaths. Well, we aren't up to that high, but this 
you don't know what this man can do in 18 months. Mm. At this, that's where we are at this point. And I, I, I frankly fear. I fear that under this administration, we have crested that hill and we are now on the downward slope as the Roman Empire mm. was. I actually feel that. I, I, I'm no expert. This is just my feeling you know, yeah. and opinion. Well, in hope for better days, as you this said is exactly in your song. what I wrote it for. Yeah. I was in Europe. I went yeah. to Europe uh, at the end of September in 2001, and I got there, and my colleagues were saying, "Is CNN part of the government?" Is CNN part, part of, of the, the government? U.S. They were asking because they had taken up the line of B the Bush administration about you know we have to do we have to go to war. They had hook, line, and sinker become, become mm -hmm. part of his, his thrust. And they were wondering, what's going on? How come? The BBC is the only thing that they were getting good information from. Yeah. Wow. And uh, one, one other thing I would want, you know, you said going to Europe to record that album with the mm -hmm. orchestra. You know, I came back from Europe, and, and I, I, people say, well, how was it? I said, well, in the United States, I'm a degenerate jazz musician. There, I have colleagues. <laughs> really? <laughs> and that's, that's how it felt. It was wonderful there. I had a classical teacher teaching under my chair. It was, it was unbelievable. Yeah. So that, that's another difference that I would like to point out. And could you tell me again where you were teaching? I was teaching at KUG Kunst University Stadt. Okay. Kunst University Stadt Graz in Graz, Austria. Wow. How did you get a gig like that? Mark Murphy again. Uh -huh. Mark Murphy has been a wonderful friend and we're I, I love the way he sings and he I'm I'm happy to say he likes the way I sing. So um actually Nancy King, great singer from uh, Portland, Oregon, was supposed to do it and she broke her leg. Oh. So it's like you break a leg, Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. <laughs> and, it's okay. and so I got the gig. <laughs> um, what do you say to uh, aspiring jazz musicians these days? Musicians or singers? Well, don't you want a singer to be a musician? Well, that's what I tell them. Okay. That's that's why I d delineate yeah, all right. it. Yeah. Because there are two things. Mm. I don't I don't have uh, that much influence or or run across that many jazz musicians that I can influence. Yeah. Okay. So the singers are the ones right. that I run into. And I tell them that um, they will never reach the place that they aspire to unless A, they become a musician, B, they are the time, the rhythm. They have to be the time. They cannot rely on the, the musicians to, to take them through the time. They have to reflect it. That's great advice. Uh, I do you have specific things? methodologies? Yeah, I can... make them play shaker. Okay. I take out, I get right. a little egg, a two dollar uh -huh. egg. That's the first thing I say. Let's go buy an egg, and then you go play it with the radio and rock and roll and funk and R and B and jazz and Latin music and anything you can. Obviously, straight ahead four four. It's not the greatest thing, mm -hmm. but it doesn't matter if you. If they go to the other idioms and get just, you know, and I tell them it's hard until it's not. And that might be a day, it might be a month, but it's hard to do until it's not. And then you lock it in and it becomes that heartbeat and you internalize it. And all of a sudden you can conduct with that little egg. That is great advice. Thank you. I'm going <laughs> to steal that. For please sure. do. Please I mean, do. I've got instrumentalists too could profit from that. Yeah. I just never really thought of that. That it's obviously that they're not really internalizing. Right. I tell them to become part of the rhythm section that way. And when the drummer is playing a solo or if it's a Latin a, a bossa nova, and I tell you know, you can conduct. If you're playing a bossa nova and you're going and you go it's all of a sudden a samba. You can double uh -huh. it up and you can conduct the the uh -huh. band that you're playing with and it's a it's and it's an integral part of you Im immersing yourself into the band, and the band knows it. If you have time, the band is going to respect you. It's not going to be like, oh, we've got to play for the singer. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know there's that. And that's, there is. We were talking about that, you know, you, you broached that earlier, that there is a, uh, uh, you know, there's a definite separation. And some musicians don't like you because you sing the head. 
Some musicians don't like you because they don't think you're as talented as they are mus musically because you're not a musician. So the, the burden of a singer is to get through those, those elements that are holding you down. You have to prove to them that you belong there, number one, and the best way to do that, I have found, is with time. And to become, at least know the changes. Know, you know, know the changes. I've been on bandstands, and I call a tune, and the bass player doesn't know the tune, and I'm feeding him the changes, and they're going, <laughs> really? You know, they don't, they don't believe that. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you have the respect, and you, they play for you so much better. That's right. The fellow Rick Matubano I mentioned told me a singer joke. I, it was real though, you know. Someone wanted to sing a tune with him, and, and she said, uh, "I have to get this right." She said, "That's a little high. Can you do it in minor?" <laughs> oh no! <laughs> you know right. that kind of thing. Yeah, like, yeah, well. I believe. You know, that, that's right. Well, that's the kind of stuff that, and you know, I must, I must come down on a lot of singers that rely on the musicians. There are a lot of singers there that, that they think they can get away with that, you know, and it's, I tell them all the time, it's, it's your fault, it's not their fault, it's the singer's fault. Your responsibility is to come up to the players, not the players to come down to you. Mm -hmm. That's not the, the ideal. Yeah. Wow. Are they teaching that at the new school? And I don't frankly know. Yeah. I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't know. I hope so, but uh -huh. I'm not sure. No, it's good advice. <laughs> um, and I, I did enjoy your, your performance last night, and um, I thought you had a good way with the audience. Thank you. And I, I think the musicians you work with appreciate the fact that, that this is such a little thing, but when the gig is over, like you're in there helping load the car and all that oh, stuff. You know, sure. it's just like such a... A way to be. Yeah, I'm, you know, I, that's what I mean. I don't think I'm superior to mm -hmm. anyone or, or inferior, but certainly not superior. And I know those guys are so talented, you know. And now I'm playing and I'm lugging around my own keyboard and guitar. <laughs> so no, no airs, no airs. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if you ever said, boy, why did I learn piano? Now I gotta, I now did. I gotta buy something. Yeah. I've gotta buy a PA. I've yeah. Gotta, like, well, I used it. to have to carry that around as a singer. You have <laughs> right. to carry your own PA. But then it got much worse uh -huh. <laughs> with heavy keyboards and Fender Rhodes. And, oh, God, did you own uh, one of those? Oh, I had a Fender Rhodes. Uh -huh. And I would lived, when I first moved to New York, I lived on the sixth floor of an elevator building and the elevator would break constantly. Uh oh. And I would have to lug that <laughs> thing up six floors. It was insane. Yeah. <laughs> And um, I remember a number of times I hit the landing and the thing went over and it, and it knocked all the screws out. It was so impacted, all the screws unscrewed. And I had to go upstairs, get a screw, and put it back together before I put it in the car to go to the gig. It was, yeah, I've been there. I always, I, you know, I, I take it for granted when I'm from here playing a gig and I can, I can time it. I can leave my house 45 minutes before I'm supposed to be somewhere and play because you know, I know it's going to take me and I know the load but I always felt sorry for people in Manhattan who had to play a gig and park their car somewhere and load in and then go repark their car oh, it yeah. must be a little hard what we do for love we, <laughs> I guess so <laughs> yeah gee I mean, you learned to I bought a little GK amplifier we were talking about changed my life. I yeah. mean, well, you know, they made things smaller and more compact and yeah. you used to have to lug around big fender roads and big amps and right. it's, it's gotten a little better. That is one good thing that's yeah. happened. Of course, the older we get, the smaller our gear. Right, and <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to ask you, um, that's the song you wrote called, I think, It, it Takes Two. Uh, it it take, Taken to Heart? No, wait. Uh, it's off, I, I can't remember where I put my CDs now. It has a. It's about. It only takes the number two. Oh, count to two. Count to two. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm curious those little turns of a phrase. Where do they come from? You know, I don't know. I, I'm trying not to. I love. You know, I don't want to use cliches as cliches, but I love to take. Cliche. I love double entendre. 
Okay. Uh, my yeah. second album was yeah. entitled Double Entendre, right. so that's how much I love them. So I try to, you know, just put a little twist on things right. and maybe turn it around or juxtapose something, you know, like the tunes I like to juxtapose. So, yeah, I, I don't know. And, you know, that tune specifically came from a comment that Eddie Gomez made. You know, we were playing, you know, he's such a great player, and so you know, technically proficient. And I said, you know, well, let's play a samba. And I can't remember how it got to be. He said, oh, well, anybody can play in two. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's like, mm -hmm. he said, it's easy to play in two. And I thought at that time, it wasn't easy for me to play in two. And um, so that's, that's the, actually the basis of that tune. But lyrically, that, that's what it is. I, I like to take things that maybe were cliches and take elements of them and mm -hmm. mix them in with double entendres yeah. and turn them around. Because I saw like almost two storylines in there developed from one thing to the next. Right. I wonder if it takes, is that a long process for you? You it, know, I like think that's... Tweaking? Well, I try, I do tweak some, but usually the lyrics come out not entirely intact, but relatively intact. And then they have long gestation periods before, between writing and recording. So I live with them for a while, mm -hmm. and then they'll, they'll modify. On the other hand, I wrote the second verse for Taken to Heart with the orchestra on the plane to the Netherlands because I only had one verse on the Concord album that I recorded it on, and they wanted to redo it. And I said, oh, I, I gotta get a second verse. So I wrote it on the plane. So some things happen. I sat for three weeks with Mountain Flight, couldn't write a thing, and then one day I wrote them in three hours. Oh. So it's very varied, oh. very. Sometimes desperation leads to inspiration. Right? Absolutely, I like time constraints. They <laughs> yeah. the, they yeah. they seem to you know crystallize things. And uh -huh. you, the pressure's on. Okay, you know maybe I can turn this rock and this piece of coal into a diamond. You know, in that <laughs> <it's> Superman. <laughs> you know? So I don't know, but uh, yeah, I just try. I aspire to write lyrics that I'm not embarrassed singing. Okay, that's really the bottom line. Uh huh. Because I I hear jazz specifically, you know those bebop tunes and everything. I, I really have a, a problem with the lyrics in, in some well, jazz tunes. those things weren't... They're perfunctory. Th yeah, and they weren't written with... Right, they wanted to get to the solo. Yeah. Everything is <laughs> yeah, to get to, get the, get solo. to the solo. Right. <laughs> I concur. <laughs> <laughs> What's coming up in the near future for you? <clears throat> well, I just got together with Tonini Arta um, just before I came up here, and we're planning a duet, a duet uh, album, and we're putting that together right now. And then I have, again, it's been uh, a year since the last album came out, so I've been compiling material. I have um, uh, some s a session planned, uh, but not specifically dated. And I, I'm going to do the material that I've been, um, been accumulating. There's a, a Maraca Valle, Orlando Maraca Valle, a Cuban flautist. Uh, I'm writing a tune. Uh, writing lyrics to his tune. I'm going to record that. Actually, the lyrics are done. And um, another Tony Yorta composition that we're going to record, both on the, his al the album with him and, and another album that I'm going to record. So I'm in the throes of trying to put together another album and teaching and privately and gigs. Uh, you got it? They come and they come, <laughs> right? I got one for you tonight. <clears throat> well, you, pro you provided this. It was a lot of fun. I thank you. Right on camera for that. Yeah, Thank you, you very much. I, I'm uh, glad to be able to do that. Um, d does it help to have a record label these days? I don't. I don't know that it do does, because I was on Concord, I was on Inner City, I was on Adventure Music, and um, I didn't see any. I worked more when I put out my first album on Beam Tide, my label, uh, with Jack DeJohn and Eddie Gomez, Double Entendre. I worked for a year and a half on that album all over the country, all over, all, all over the world, and yet with the albums on labels, things mm. weren't really that great. No, I don't know. Uh, as I say, I think as the quality <clears throat> goes down, the singers of quality or the musicians of quality have a harder time because the level is so low that everybody can do it. Right. Well, not everybody can do what you do, <laughs> say that, so... Thanks, man. Anyway, it's been a great pleasure talking with oh, you today. Oh, thank Appreciate you, man. A okay. pleasure, totally.